Hello and welcome again. This is MG3 and uh, today we'll be looking at another um, major topic in vector spaces. This is the inner product. Now before we get to the inner product, let's have a look at something you have seen before, the dot product. This is a recapitulation and I'd like you to go back to your wherever you learned the dot product from or look at the earlier chapters in any you know, A-level maths book for what I want you to do now. Now you know that the dot product of vectors a and b is given as the length of a times the length of b times the cosine of theta, where theta is the angle between a and b. All right. Now what I'd like you to show is that the dot product of a and b can also be written as uh, the sum i goes from 1 to n of a i times b i, where a, the vector a is written as a1, a2, all the way to an, and b as b1, b2, all the way to bn. Now show this for uh, the case n is equal to 2, so in two-dimensional space, but you can actually do the geometry easily and show that uh, this expression here leads to this one in blue down here. Okay? Because what we're going to see now is that we're going to generalize the idea of the inner product. We're going to call it, sorry, of the dot product, and we're going to come up with this, uh, this concept of the inner product, which is much more general. And uh, in doing so, we are going to, you know, re-examine this idea of what uh, uh, what this product means. Now, let's think of some things which we should keep in mind. Uh, if A and B are orthogonal, so if theta is 90 degrees, then the dot product is zero. We'd like to see the same for the inner product. And uh, if I wanted to find the length of A, so if I, you know, what I could do is just simply do the dot product of A with A. In this case, theta is 0, and I would get the length squared of A here. So the length of A, I'll put this here in green. Actually, green is a bad color for a screen. The length of A is equal to the dot product of A with A, and I then need a square root. So we're going to look for the uh, analogies of these properties when we look at the inner product. So here I put down the generalization of the inner product, it saves me some time. Uh, the inner product of vectors a and b in this vector space is written as uh, angle bracket a bar b angle bracket. Now this is the, the bracket notation from Dirac. Now because you're going to see this a lot in quantum mechanics, this is the notation I, I'm using here. There is an alternative. So Here's the bracket notation, angle brackets A bar B. This is the bra part. It's just German for bracket, by the way. Uh, and the equivalent notation in some texts is this, uh, is the round brackets, A comma B. Either notation is fine, I don't really care very much which one you use as long as you're consistent with it. Now in this course we'll be using Riley Hobson and Benz and Riley's book which I will show you here uses the bracket notation from Dirac. So that's the one we're going to be using over here. Okay so just this is an aside on notation. Uh, close that. Equivalent notation. right? Uh, now, <laughs> all I've done is said that the inner product is written like this, but what uh, is it? Well, I'm not going to define it yet, but I'm going to say that we expect the inner product to satisfy the following two properties, just these two properties. And from here, we will derive the rest. First property is that the inner product of A with B is equal to the complex conjugate of the inner product of B with A. And that's the first change over the dot product. Because of the complex conjugate here, we're going to see that this generalizes to complex vectors, while the dot product is defined for real vectors. Uh, next, if you have two scalars, lambda and mu, that's a lambda here, and mu belonging to the set of complex numbers, that's what this means, for all lambda and mu belonging to the set of complex numbers, uh, the inner product of the vector a plus the linear combination of lambda b plus mu c 
where b and c belong to the same vector space. That's equal to lambda times the inner product of a with b plus mu times the inner product of a with c. Okay? These are, <laughs> this might seem a little too abstract at the moment, but let's just, you know, take these rules as they are given and let's see if we can prove some things with them before we go on to, to the actual definition of the inner product. So here's some proofs. The first thing I'd like you to show is uh, that lambda a plus mu b in a product with c. So this is the bra side, this is the get side. I want you to show that this is going to be equal to lambda star in a product of a with c plus mu star in a product of b with c. Now at this point you might want to stop the video and show it for yourself and then come back to the proof as I'm going to have it here. Alright, but I'm going to go on now with the proof. So how would you do this? Now all you can use are these two rules given up here, 1 and 2. That's the only thing you're allowed to use. So how would you do that? Well, let's see. Okay. Um, let's see what we can do. What we can start with is take the left-hand side, so the LHS, left-hand side is equal to lambda A plus mu B in the product with C. Now let's use one of these rules. I'm going to use rule 1 and invert it, so take the complex conjugate. So each time we use a rule, we'll put it down here. Rule 1. This is going to be equal to C, the inner product of C with uh, lambda A plus mu B. And when I do this, I have to complex conjugate the whole thing. Okay, now we've got something which is in the form for which we can use rule 2. So let's do that. But rule 2 applies not to the complex conjugate, but to the inner product itself. So what I'm going to do is pull out the complex conjugate into a square brace there. Just writing it down. And we'll, just for our own sake, we'll pull the complex conjugate out there, outside the square brackets. Now what's inside the square brackets is exactly in the form where we can use rule 2. So let's use it. So that's going to be square brackets. Uh, lambda C in a product with A plus mu C in a product with B. Square brackets and the complex conjugate there. Let's check it and that's indeed the correct way of using rule 2. So that's rule 2, so let's put that there. Okay. And now we bring the complex conjugate in. These are all complex numbers. So the complex conjugate acts on each one of them. And that's going to give us lambda star C A star mu star C, B, star. Now we go back to rule 1, but we use it in reverse. We now have things which are this form. I'm going to now invert them to get rid of the complex conjugate. So back to rule 1. We can't do anything to the lambda star. That stays as it is. But the C, A star can be written as the inner product of A with C star. Oh, no star. It's gone now. That's from rule 1, and we apply rule 1 again here. And this becomes B with C. And that's it. It's done. Okay, now if you've got that, what I'd like you to show are two more. Here's number 2. 
Now, the reason I'm asking you to show these is because we're going to use them extensively later on. So it's best you get the practice now. Show that this is equal to, I wonder if you could guess it, lambda star mu inner product of A with B. And the third one is lambda A plus mu B in a product with gamma D plus uh, chi C. This is equal to lambda star gamma A in a product with D plus lambda star chi A in a product with C plus mu star gamma B in a product with D plus mu star chi B in a product with C. Okay, so this would be a, a nice kind of exercise for you to test yourself and see if you can get prove these things using those two rules only. All right, now let's move on. So we've got the two properties which the inner product should satisfy. This is, those were rules one and two here. But I'd like to now know what is the actual form of the inner product. So let's see if we can figure that out. So what is this? Okay, that's the jackpot question now. And uh, to figure this out, what we're going to have to do is to write A and B in their component form. Remember, we can, if we have a basis set, so given a basis of vectors EI in an n-dimensional space, that means uh, that the n of these EIs, we can write the vector A uniquely as i goes from 1 to n and uh, this is a unique expansion if you've understood the previous uh, recording you will know why ei and b is another expansion i goes from 1 to n bi ei okay so the inner product of A with B is now written as the inner product of the sum AI EI bar the sum Now I'm going to show you how to exp how to work this out, what this thing is, uh, the long way first, and then we'll come to a shorter, more compact, and more elegant way. So here's the long way. Long way. Let's write the sum out in full. A1, E1, plus A2, E2, plus dot, 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 plus a n e n that's the bra side and then the cat side b1 e1 plus b2 e2 plus dot 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 plus b n e n and now what we're going to do is to use these rules here especially if we're going to use this one, but uh, I'm going to use uh, the form of that rule which is given over here, where we've got an expansion on both sides. We're going to have to cross multiply every one of those terms. And if you have a, a, 
a scalar on the bra side, it will get complex conjugated. So the lambda and the mu get complex conjugated in each term, but the scalars and the ket side don't get complex conjugated. All right, so that's what we're going to do here. So this then is going to be equal to a1 is a scalar in the bra side, so it'll be a1 star times b1, which is not starred, and then you have an e1 bar e1, plus a1 star times b2, e1 times e1 in the product with e2, plus all the way till you come to the last term, a1 star times bn in a product of e1 with en. Then comes a2 star b1 e2 in a product with e1 plus a2 e2 times b2 e2. So it'll be a2 e2 in the product with e2 plus all the way to the last one which will be a sorry a2 star bn e2 bar e n and this is going to go on all the way till you end up with the last term which will be this one times each of these so dot 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 and then the last one is going to be a n star b1 uh, e n e1 plus a n star b2 e n bar e1 plus all the way and as you may guess this is a n star b n e n bar e n now that's quite a long-winded way of doing this i'd like to find a simpler way of writing this okay and the simpler way is going to be the following so the short way the short way realizes that what we can do is to pull out, you know, each one of these objects here is a vector. It's a linear combination of vectors, hence it's a vector. So is this. Let's do this in two steps. So I'm going to call, I'm going to keep one of these vectors in the original form and I'm going to expand the other one. So let's keep uh, the A vector in its original form and I'm going to expand just the B vector. So A in the product with B is equal to A and we'll have the expansion I goes from 1 to N of BI EI for B. Now from rule 2, what we can see, there's rule 2, it's here. Uh, if you have a linear combination of vectors in the ket side, we can simply pull off, you know, we simply expand it and pull those, uh, those uh, uh, constants out and then we have the inner product of each vector with each vector on the cat side. The vector on the bra side with each vector on the cat side. What that means here is that we can pull out the sum from the bra cat and these coefficients come off as they are and then we have the vector in the bra side in a product with the vector in the ket side that sounds very simple and i hope you've understood how to do this we have just used rule two in its generalized form and i'd like you to understand this fully so this is quite an important step Please make sure you've understood it. Now what we're going to do is to apply the same to the A expansion. Remember, we need to expand A also as a linear, as a, 
in this form here. So now let's put the A expansion in there. So we have a sum I goes from 1 to N, BI, and now I want to put a sum in here. AI, EI, bar, EI. Now, I've deliberately done this because this is a bad way of writing it down. I've got a sum here which has a dummy index i. Now what do I mean by dummy index? It means an index which is completely summed over. So on the left hand side there is no i. All the i's are summed over. It's like doing an integration. When you write the integral of f of x dx over let's say 0 to 10, well you're integrating over all the x values. So the, the result does not depend on x. All right. Now when you have dummy indices here and you have a sum within a sum, you must never use the same index. If I've got an i here, then this should be a j. So I'm going to change that to a j, j, j. And that means I can identify that there are two different sums going on here. Now, in exactly the same way we were able to pull out the sum from the ket side, we will pull out the sum from the bra side. But because the sum is now in the bra side, we'll use one of the results we showed over here. This one here is when you've got a linear combination of vectors in the bra side and you want to simplify the, the inner product. What you have to do is to, for all these scalars come out of the, of the bra ket but they, they get a complex conjugation. Okay, so the lambda and the mu get complex conjugated, and then you have each vector in the bra side being uh, with, taken with the inner product of the vector on the ket side. So A with C and B with C. And that's what we're going to do here. So go back to black. Oh, let's use, uh, that's fine. So we have the sum over I i goes from 1 to n bi and now each of these scalars will come out of the bra side and they'll get a complex conjugation so a j oh i forgot the sum we pull the sum out j goes from 1 to n then the the scalar a j it will get a complex conjugation and then we're left with the vector e j in the product with e I. Now we can just pull these two sums together. The sum i goes from 1 to n. The sum j goes from 1 to n. b i a j star e j e i. Now what I'd like you to do is for the case n is equal to 2, so for n is equal to 2, show that if I call this a, and if I call the long expression b, show that a is equal to b. These are identical. And what was crucial here, this is a much more elegant derivation, but it took it it will take some understanding of how you manipulate these sums, especially these double sums, how you pull them out, what do you have to do when you pull out a sum from an inner product? Which of these coefficients, which of these scalars gets complex conjugated? It's always the scalar in the bra side that gets com gets complex conjugated. Never the scalar in the ket side. Okay? And now we are getting there. Now this term here, is what's called G, J, I. That's the notation Riley, Hobson, and Benz uses, but uh, we'll just stick with it. All right, so G, J, I is equal to E j, the inner product of e, the vector E j with the vector E i. Remember, these are basis vectors. 
alternatively, g i j is equal to e i at e j. All right. So in compact form, what we have then written is that the inner product of A with B is written as the sum i goes from 1 to n, the sum j goes from 1 to n, b i a j star g j i. Okay, which we can write as, let's rearrange this a bit. I'll put the sum over j first, and then the sum over i. a j star g j i b i. So now it's in order. It's an a j j i i. Right? That's what I was after. This is the general form of the inner product. What I'd like to do now is to show you some special forms. And the special cases will be more useful for us in this course, but when you get into um, different parts of geometry or uh, of gravi uh, uh, space-time gravity, you may find the general form to be more useful. So here we are going to use a special form, and in the special form, G will be particularly simple. We're going to choose G, J, I to be 1 if I is equal to J and 0 otherwise. So let's see what this, what this does to uh, What this will do then is, therefore, A, B in a product will be equal to, let's look at the sum here. If I is not equal to J, we'll get a 0. The only time we will get uh, a, a 1 here, it's a non-zero term, is if I is equal to J. That means once we have chosen J to be something, I must be that same value, otherwise you get a 0. Effectively, what this has done is it's taken these two sums and it's collapsed it onto one sum. So this becomes the sum j is 1 to n. And then we will have a j star b j. Now this might seem like a little bit of magic over here, but I'd like you to think about it. So stop and think. The only time when, uh, once you have fixed j to be some value, let's say j is equal to 10, i must be equal to 10 if you want a non-zero contribution from here, because g i j is equal to 1 only if i is equal to j. So the second sum is almost irrelevant. The only terms in the second sum that will contribute is that, w uh, that case when i is equal to j. That's why we can drop the second sum altogether and simply change all the i's to j's. And then you'll have G, oh, I should have put this in here. And uh, then you'll have G, J, J. But G, J, J is going to be equal to 1, because that's the case when I is equal to J, you get a 1. All right. Now, I like writing sums. <laughs> This is just my preference. I like writing sums in terms of i when I can help it. So I'm going to write this as i is 1, sum over i going from 1 to n, a i star b i. Does it matter? No, it doesn't matter. Because j here is a dummy index, meaning you're summing over all the j values, 
I can call it whatever I want. I can call it I, J, K, Alpha, Beta, Gamma. It doesn't matter. But this can only be done when you encounter dummy indices. And I'll have more to say about this. But uh, dummy indices are the key here. Now, by the way, this is starting to look like uh, what we began with, what I asked you to show about the dot product. I asked you to show that the dot product of vectors A and B can be written as the sum of AI times BI. And what we've got here is the inner product when you have the special case where gij is equal to 1 for i is equal to j or 0 otherwise, then the inner product is the sum i goes from 1 to n ai star bi. So that's one difference here. We've got a star, but otherwise it looks the same as the dot product. And this is, uh, in fact, by design. So we can write this down then explicitly as a1 star b1 plus a2 star b2 plus all the way a n star b n and we can also then define the dot product the, the inner product of a with itself i would just replace the b's with a's so we'll have uh, uh, let's do put the sum form first i goes from 1 to n a i star a i, but a i star a i is simply the modulus of a i. Squared. So this is equal to a one squared plus mod a two squared plus all the way to mod a n squared. And now finally, I'd like to define the norm, and then we are done. The norm of a vector A is written as double bar A double bar, and this is defined as the square root of the inner product of A with itself. And the norm is the length. except its generalized length. It's not the length in a Cartesian space necessarily, but it could be the length in any of our vector spaces where the objects may not be uh, line segments with, uh, with direction and magnitude. And that's why we use the term norm rather than length over here. And what this inner product lets us do is once we have defined our A, once we've got, once we have a basis for our space, then we know what the vectors A and B uh, represented as in terms of a basis. Uh, we can then define the inner product of each vector with itself in this way. We can define the norm of the vectors with itself. And then what we can do is normalize them. We can normalize vectors by taking a vector A and dividing it by its norm. And this will be given a special name, a hat. Let's write that properly, a hat. We will use this terminology hat uh, with the hat to represent vectors that have been normalized. Okay. Now, this means, and I'm going to end here, that that original basis set we used. of vectors um, we had a basis set of vectors EI in which we represented our vectors A and B that was over here let's see where was it up here we had this basis set of vectors now these basis set these basis functions uh, spanned the space but they were not necessarily normalized or orthogonal or anything like that. And now we are in a position to make them normalized. All we need to do is, instead of take each of the EIs and transform it 
into an E hat, which is equal to EI divided by the norm of EI. In this way, we will get a basis set of vectors E hat I, which span the space as before, except that now they are normalized. And this is the kind of basis set we will use for in the future. So I will stop here. We will come back to, uh, there are a few more issues, uh, things about uh, basis uh, sets that I'd like to talk to you about. But let me just pause here while I check my notes just to see. Yes, there was something I had wanted to uh, mention before actually stopping, but we are at the end now. Uh, it's that once you've got these normalized basis functions, then we are in a position to see what this definition of G means. Now, we defined GJI to be EJ in the product of EJ with EI. Okay. When we use normalized uh, basis vectors, then what we are doing is writing gji as ej hat ei hat and this would ensure that uh, when we have i is equal to j we have a normalized vector on both sides and then we will end up getting uh, so for i is equal to j this will ensure that g i i or g j j is equal to 1. But what I haven't yet shown is why should, you know, how do we ensure that uh, when i is not equal to j, g j i is 0? How do we ensure that when i is not equal to j, this thing gives us 0? In other words, how do we make our basis uh, vectors orthogonal? And that's going to be the next step of this uh, quest for a basis set. We stop here.